So let's move to the first paper. I want to, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Marion Dowd of the Atlantic University, former uh, uh, Sligo uh, uh, IT. Marion is a prehistorian, a very distinguished one. But that isn't all she does. Because she deals with caves, indeed anything that archaeologists deal with in the uplands requires a multidisciplinary approach. So she's not dealing with prehistory, she's dealing with early medieval and Vikings, she's dealing with a civil war hideout. So, Marion, you're very welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. It's lovely to be here in Cork, and I'd just like to thank John and Helene and Eugenia and all the team for uh, this fabulous conference. It's, it's really great to be here. So what I'm going to talk about today is a cave that we investigated, three of us investigated earlier this year uh, in County Sligo that was associated with the Civil War as well as with the War of Independence. Uh, we believe that this is the first archaeological excavation of a Civil War site in Ireland and I hope that you will see the value of taking an archaeological approach like this and hopefully further uh, studies will follow. So um, just to give a little bit of background to the site, uh, we're here in Sligo. Um, uh, this is Sligo Town here in the northwest of Ireland. Uh, this is the site I'm going to be talking about, Tumora Cave, and it's just north of Glencar Cave in uh, North County Sligo. Um, and here is Rahley House, which was the headquarters of uh, the North Sligo IRA during the Civil War. So essentially the National Army had moved into Sligo town and pushed the Republicans out of the town and into their headquarters at Rahley. Um, we know from an intelligence report uh, previous to September 1922 that there were 120 Republicans associated with Rahley stationed in or around the house. Um, so they closed in on Rahley House and the IRA uh, evacuated the house and fled up Ben Bulban Mountain and into the, the mountains in, in the vicinity. Um, Billy Pilkington was the general OC of the area and he had given orders to the men that they should seek out Tumore Cave, um, which is 17 kilometres away from Rahley House. Uh, 17 kilometres doesn't necessarily seem like a long distance, but we have to remember that this was over very, very rough mountainous terrain, very difficult um, terrain to, to move across. There were other caves and other hideouts between Rahali and Tumore Cave, but Pilkington's decision not to go to those other caves suggests to us that this was by far the most secure um, location. And certainly our archaeological excavations indicate that it was very well prepared uh, uh, for long-term um, use as a hideout. So on the 20th of September 1922, uh, we have Rahley House being evacuated. 24 to 30 Republicans were arrested by the National Army on the mountains and taken to Sligo Jail. Six Republicans were surrounded and shot on the mountain um, by the National Army in, in two groups. The first four, uh, Seamus Devins, Brian McNeil, Patrick Carl and Joseph Banks were uh, killed at, at about 9.30 in the morning um, and they had uh, come to a point that was about four and a half kilometres from the cave hideout. And then uh, Harry Benson and Thomas Langan were killed at a separate location a few hours later. Uh, they were within 3.5 kilometres of the cave hideout. 34 of their compatriots um, managed to get to the cave hideout and they stay there for up to six weeks. So we'll just skip back to this map again and I'll point out you can see the two locations um, where four of the, the men were killed and the other two were killed and how close they were to, to Moore Cave. And these uh, six men became known as Sligo's Noble Six. So, um, in the this very sparse references to this site, it's called the Glencar Hideout, and that appears to be the name by which it was known during the War of Independence and in the Civil War. It's in really rugged mountainous terrain. You can see here Glencar Lake. Uh, in the distance and it's on the side of a mountain in what's known as the Swiss Valley. 
Very, very isolated location, very remote, very rural. There are um, signs of you know, habitation you know, within about 700 metres of the cave, but generally it's quite an isolated spot. Uh, you also need to climb up part of a cliff face to access the cave. The entrance is very well concealed. So um, earlier this year, in March and April, three of us got together and we decided to carry out an archaeological survey and excavation of the site. The three of us are archaeologists, we're not historians, um, but we felt that uh, we could maybe bring something new to uh, the Civil War studies that have taken place um, about uh, Sligo. Um, so this is the three of us here, very glamorous group as you can see, uh, and we carried out a six-day excavation in the cave. We had been to the cave prior to this and we had noticed traces of human activity primarily in the form of pottery sherds and also some flagstones. But apart from that, we weren't sure at all whether we would find anything, whether there would be anything of note. As it turned out, it uh, was a very fruitful six days on site. Uh, this is a plan of the cave. One of the interesting things is that very few people um, knew exactly where the cave was. Many people in Sligo and environs knew about this hideout, but very few people had been there. And the people who had been there had no sense um, generally of how long it was. Um, so we carried out the first survey, and this is a drawing of the cave here. It's essentially 18 metres in length, which sounds like a decent enough space, but actually only the outer 10 metres are habitable. So the area that we have marked in red here um, is the area that was uh, used as a hideout. There's a second smaller cave to the side that's very, very small. It may have been used, for example, for storing material, but it, it's not that accessible. This green area here in front is a, a sheltered area that maybe the men occasionally used when it was safe to emerge from the cave. So uh, the first thing to point out that, that we noticed during the survey and excavation was how well concealed the entrance is. And it's actually very difficult to depict this in an image because it, it is so well concealed. Uh, but I'll just draw your attention there to the large boulder um, that's highlighted by the white box. This is a natural part of the cave collapse, but we believe it was maneuvered and manipulated into place, and by so doing, it completely obscures the cave entrance. So for people passing on the, the valley below the cave, they had absolutely no sense that there was a cave there. They couldn't see the entrance. Um, here you've got a close-up of the boulder again. Um, on either side of that boulder, they piled up stones, and some of those stones were set with a very loose mortar, a uh, very rough... Um, kind of camouflage, and it's possible that they also accentuated this with vegetation. But it serves a, a, a really excellent purpose because it completely obscures the cave. So unless you knew exactly where to go, you'd never find this cave. And we've had that experience, people telling us they've been looking for the cave and they just couldn't find it, even when they had GPS coordinates. Uh, the first feature that we uncovered during the excavation was a series of stone steps. So that large boulder that I mentioned, this is the inside of that boulder blocking the cave entrance. And then there's a very narrow uh, space to the side of that boulder that uh, allows you to, to access the cave. And they built a series of stone steps to allow safe access into the cave. Otherwise, the, the natural silty layer is very, very slippy. So when we were working there, within a few days, it was treacherous. So we decided to remove that to see how they coped with it. And they had uh, built these stone steps. Um, a very surprising feature was that we also uncovered this mortar floor. So this would be the typical mortar floor that you would find in every 1920s cottage in Ireland. It's very difficult for you to see, but these are parts of the mortar that had broken away and that we recovered during the excavation. So this lovely, creamy mortar. Um, and essentially what they're doing here is they're sealing uh, the cave floor. So that serves multiple purposes. It keeps the area clean. It also um, acts as an insulation and it keeps it you know, drier, warmer. Uh, this is uh, the area where the men would have slept, where they would have hung out by day. We found no evidence of bedding. 
Um, but if we look at the Bureau of Military History and they talk about how dugouts operated, they mention quite a bit um, the use of mattresses, that mattresses were brought into dugouts and that you know, men would sleep on mattresses. That's a possibility here. But certainly um, the effort involved in mortaring this floor tells us a, a very intentional usage um, of, for the cave. We also have this low walling along here that's also mortared. So you can see along the side of the living space, at the back here and up along here, it's kind of fallen away. We're not quite sure of the purpose of that. It might be simply to define the living space. Um, it might have been also uh, to clear away boulders from the internal area. Uh, but that work has also been mortared together, or those stones have been mortared together. We also recovered a series of flagstones that have been placed on top of part of the mortared floor. We don't really know the function of these. They weren't particularly well set, but they've likely been moved over the intervening 100 years. Again, they may have acted as a, a surface for particular activities. So in terms of food, um, we have quite an unusual assemblage of animal bone from the site. There were... Um, remains of five sheep that were butchered. Now we're waiting on radiocarbon dates. We don't know if that uh, butchered sheep, um, sorry, we're not sure if that meat was uh, being consumed during uh, the Civil War period or if it relates to post-Civil War activity or pre-Civil War activity. Um, but a huge number of butchered sheep bones. We also have a rabbit here. And there's no sign that the rabbit was cooked or butchered, but it was found in uh, Civil War layers. So there's a very high possibility that it represents food. Uh, we also have fish, and just this morning uh, I have preliminary identifications that this is cod. So, you know, part of what they're eating is cod. Uh, we also found lots of uh, pottery sherds from three different vessels, a dish, a platter, and then a large pot. Um, none of this ware would have been the nice ware that you would have found in someone's kitchen. Most of it is kind of heavy ware that you might have found in the dairy, for example. And we're assuming that food was brought on these platters and dishes and bowls to the cave, and um, you know the vessels eventually broke and we're finding pieces 100 years later. Uh, some more personal items. We found this lovely fragment of a clay pipe. Um, it's in perfect condition, which suggests that it was never actually used. So we may have a scenario where you know, somebody has brought up a pipe so that the men can enjoy uh, a simple pleasure and it breaks. So that would have been a very unpopular person, whoever dropped it. Um, we also have a thread uh, here at the bottom from um, an item of clothing. Again, looking at something very simple, that somebody went to the back of the cave, their, their clothing got snagged on a piece of rock, and they've left this thread behind. This is a, a little bit of a mystery. Um, it's a finely woven copper wire uh, with a textile over it. Originally, we thought it might be a boot lace, but you can see here it's got a loop at one end. So it may be something like a, a drawstring. If anybody has any ideas about the function of this, we'd love to hear about it. And then these are our mystery pieces. So again, if anyone has any idea of what these might represent, do please uh, let us know. Originally, we thought that they might be from a bandolier, but post-conservation, we can now see that that's not the case. So what you're looking at here is 17 copper rivets. So you have the, the head of the rivet or nail here, and then the other side, you have this little washer, and you have the... Um, the shaft of the, the rivet going through it, and, and they are usually hammered back. But the, the host material is iron. We thought it might be leather and that this might be from a bandolier, but it's not, it's iron. So if anybody has any ideas, do please uh, let us know. Uh, it had passed down through family narrative that the men couldn't light fires in the cave because that would have attracted attention. Um, and our excavations supported that. We didn't find any evidence of burning. If there had been a fire in the cave, you would expect soot on the, the cave's roof and walls. You would find lots of charcoal. We didn't find that. We did find two sods of turf, and we found charcoal um, from burnt turf. 
we don't think this relates to a fire in the cave. We think that this is a, a practice that we see uh, referenced quite a lot in the folklore collections, where sods of turf are dipped in paraffin, and then they act as a light for a, a space. So we think that these may have lit up the cave, but they didn't actually um, create fires. We also found um, something that will be recognisable to most of you, uh, fragments of a three-legged iron skillet pot. One of those fragments was outside the cave and the others were found inside. It's a very heavy implement um, and it would be very unusual for that to be in a cave context halfway up a mountain. Uh, and our theory is that this may have been a portable toilet. Um, it's believed that 34 men stayed in the cave for up to six weeks and certainly they wouldn't have been um, exiting and entering the cave regularly throughout the day because that would have drawn attention to them. The National Army were all over the mountains um, at least for several days after um, 20th, 22nd of September and if they were constantly exiting and entering the cave they would have left a track that would have been very, very noticeable. So... It makes sense that they had a portable toilet in the cave, we think deeper in the cave, and that this was taken outside maybe at night time. The advantage of a skillet pot over a, a bed pot, or the typical chamber pot that we might be accustomed to, is that this is far more durable. Um, it's also large enough um, to accommodate or serve for 34 men. Initially, we had... Um, wondered whether the very end of the cave may have been used as a toilet, but uh, our colleague Professor John Casella from ATU Sligo, uh, who's a forensic uh, specialist, carried out some basic forensic work there and, and did not detect any signs of the, that part of the cave being used. But as he also pointed out, it would have become very dangerous if the, this part of the cave was being used as a, an open uh, toilet. People would have got sick very, very quickly. So this is the toilet, we believe. Uh, we were also intrigued at the possibility of finding graffiti, and initially um, none was very visible. But then this one rock um, inside the cave, so if this is the cave entrance here, this is the walling I was talking about, and this is the mortared floor. And there's one quite prominent uh, boulder, it's part of the cave wall, and you may be able to distinguish that with a photogrammetry we've um, revealed. And they're also visible to the naked eye, a series of, of abstract lines and scratches. There are nothing like initials, no depictions or anything like that, but there are deliberate markings. Uh, and we're again waiting for uh, further processing of that data. So... Um, the, the story that had been passed down in the locality was that 34 men, 34 Republicans, hid there for six weeks in 1922 following the, the takeover of Rahali House. We've been able to identify five of those men. Uh, we put out a public call a few months ago and some other relatives have also got in touch with us. Um, these are four of those men. Paddy Branley, whose family lived very near the cave, and it's very likely that Paddy or one of his brothers were the, the people who originally found the cave. Uh, Tom Daly from Belique, uh, he, um, his family know that he stayed there. Jack Trooper McHugh from um, Sligo Town and Billy Pilkington, who was the general OC. Um, Billy Pilkington was nursing a broken shoulder. He had broken his clavicle or scapula at some point on the journey um, between Rahali and um, Tumor Cave. So his six weeks in the cave, he, he was dealing with uh, the added um, difficulty of a broken shoulder. And, and a nice piece of, of narrative that's been passed down is that when he was in the cave, that he made a promise that he would become a priest if he... Um, escaped uh, or survived the ordeal, and he did. So he, he went on to become a redemptorist priest and spent most of his career in South Africa and later in England. But of course, no hideout is ever effective unless you have quite a complex infrastructure and support system um, around that. Sarah Branley here on the left uh, was the mother of Paddy Branley and Dominic Branley. They lived about 750 metres from the cave and she's known to have looked after the men. There was one particular bad night where some of the, the men came down to the house and she looked after their feet. Trench foot was a, a problem 
and she also roasted a lamb on another occasion. Uh, Maggie O'Connor uh, lived in an adjoining townland. It seems her family had her family home is a safe house during the War of Independence and Civil War. She also took food to the men. Apparently, at 3 a.m. every every night, uh, she took food up. She had a, a special interest because she married pa Paddy Branley about four months after he came out of the cave, and then. Bridget Pilkington uh, was a sister-in-law of Billy Pilkington. Her husband, Joseph, had been arrested, um, but Bridget would come out from Sligo Town with other women on a donkey and cart uh, to Rathcormac, bringing food, and that food was then taken along the Glencar Valley to the men. So these are just three of the people, but again, we have to imagine the enormous support network um, to sustain 34 men for up to six weeks. Uh, this is what survives of the Branley home, and, and this relationship between the Branley home and Tumor Cave is really, really key. We know that the Branley home, a very isolated location, was important during the War of Independence, um, and it seems to have been, you know, the, the kind of um, middle point between uh, IRA Brigade and uh, use of the cave. So what was it like living in a cave like this? Um, initially, it might seem very unpleasant, but if we compare it to descriptions of dugouts that we see in the Bureau of Military History records, it had the advantage of being very well ventilated, and there's a very small opening at the back of the cave, so there's a free circulation of air, so ventilation uh, was not a problem. It's also a dry cave, so uh, while it might have been damp and cold, it wasn't wet, um, they were immediately to um, benefits over some of the other dugouts. As I mentioned, there are other caves that were closer to Rahali House that were much more spacious, and those caves were not used. And again, it's probably because this was in such a secure location uh, that Billy Pilkington decided to opt for this one. Uh, it would have been very cold in September. We've looked at the weather records for September 1922, and on one particular night, for example, it was minus 5 degrees. Um, very cramped. Here you can see... Uh, six people and the photographer, so seven people in the living space, and it's already beginning to feel claustrophobic. Um, obviously, when the men went in there in September 1922, they didn't think that they would be staying there for six weeks. Uh, but as the days progressed, that, that period of time became longer and longer. It is big enough. To, to house 34 people, uh, but we feel that Billy Pilkington was key to organizing the men, creating structure, creating routine. He was a very religious man. Um, we know that during the War of Independence, he always had his men say the rosary before they went out on a job. So probably things like that, tasks like saying the rosary, if you consider that a task, would have been a regular part of daily life in the cave. Um, one of the things that's passed down and that I've heard from quite a number of people in Sligo Town is uh, reports of trench foot. That's what was uh, remembered, how the men's feet were in a terrible state after all of these weeks in the cave. So, um, do we need archaeologists looking at um, the Civil War? You know, why don't we leave it to historians? And of course I'm biased, I'm going to say we are important and we can provide a certain um, maybe contribution to historical studies. I'm just going to mention three points that I think um, you know, this small excavation has demonstrated about the value of archaeological excavation. There are archaeological surveys and some fantastic archaeological approaches um, being carried out, particularly by Damien Shields over the last 10, 15 years. But archaeological excavation is, is new in this area. So essentially, I would argue that caves and dugouts, this is the archaeology of guerrilla warfare. And when we think about guerrilla warfare, we usually think of the action, the ambushes, the dynamic aspect. But of course, the other side of that coin is the more mundane, domestic, everyday. They're hiding out in horrible conditions. Um, and the cave provides one indication of that. We also can see from two more, I think we were all quite surprised at the level of preparation and work that went into creating this space and making it as comfortable as possible. 
Uh, the material culture, the pottery, the animal bones, the clay pipe, they give us an indication of how the men lived and operated uh, in these spaces. And, and we can, again, compare and contrast that with the records in the Bureau of Military History accounts. Um, the other aspect is that dugouts and hideouts often don't survive. You know, by their nature, they were ephemeral or they were not very sturdy, um, they were backfilled afterwards or, or just completely obliterated. And caves, and here is where I'm incredibly biased, are fantastic because they're really acting as time capsules. You know, these are places that have been in the landscape for tens of thousands of years and they will continue to be. So whatever way that they were used, whether it's in the Civil War or in the Bronze Age, the superstructure is still there. Um, so we know that lots of caves in Ireland were used during the War of Independence and Civil War. So I think they offer us a perspective that many of the other, we say, wooden or earth dug uh, hideouts and uh, dugouts um, don't offer anymore. Um, the artifacts and objects that we recover, they offer a very tangible connection to the past and to people in the past. And if we're trying to make uh, the Civil War more accessible to the general public, to children, things like... Um, Actual objects make a, a big impact. It doesn't need to be a revolver or Michael Collins slippers. It can be a piece of pottery. It can be a clay pipe fragment. And it's all about the context, knowing that that clay pipe fragment came from a cave that was used as a Civil War hideout. Most importantly, uh, however, and this is, I suppose, the sobering point, is that our Civil War sites don't have any legal protection at the moment. Um, it's not covered under, under the National Monuments Act, so it's very, very vulnerable. And when we lose the places we, and, and the, the material culture associated with those places, it's, it's gone forever. Um, so what I think we all need to be looking at, regardless of our professions, protecting um, those sites. We can't protect every site, but certainly key sites. Uh, and at the same time, archaeological excavation and survey can document in great detail uh, those sites that are, are going to be lost or destroyed. So um, I'd like to thank you on behalf of myself and my colleagues, Robert and James, and uh, I'll leave it at that.